gentlemen eminent members of chest council of india and other physicians who have kind enough to log in a very good morning to members who have logged in from all around the world i am atri gangopadhyay governor east zone chest council of india and today is the mega panel discussion on our perspectives in treatment of covid when our catch line is that everything under the sun including the heat of the sun have been used for the treatment of covid so basically today we have five doctors from five states who each has treated over 5000 covid patients asking them to share their experiences for the treatment of asymptomatic mild and moderate covid i would also request our audience who are eager with their questions to keep their questions to asymptomatic mild and moderate covid because severe covid and post covid sequela are topics of other seminars other master classes now before i begin it's my great pleasure to introduce our panelists today we have from kerala dr narayana pradeep who was also the general secretary of chest council of india and the founder trustee then we have from tamil nadu dr mani maran who is the state head for tamil nadu and based at chennai from there we move on to maharashtra from mumbai where we have dr agam vora who is also the west zone governor from there we go to gujarat from vadodara we have dr sonia dalal who is also the state head of gujarat and then we come to central india dr ravi dosi who is the current secretary of cci as well as governor of central zone before we begin with the questions one request from dr n h krishna our founder and current chairperson trustee that this discussion should be completely free of non it should contain non controversial and it should be a political for the benefit of everyone so here we begin our opening question to dr narayana pradeep who was from the first state to see covid patients in india what symptoms you look for in covid and you distinguish covid from other flu good evening uh, <clears throat> everybody um, at the outset i would like to thank the chest council of india for providing me this opportunity i thank dr hatri gangot gangopadhyay for a wonderful uh, introduction of uh, all the panelists and uh, good evening uh, to uh, all the onshore offshore all the peoples of chest council of india and all the pulmonologists and general practitioners physicians who are viewing our program this is basically uh, program was uh, uh, when dr atri called and dr nh krishna our founder trustee called to fix the program then we thought like we lot uh, we will discuss what is our experiences more of the from our exactly from the field and uh, how we have are able to treat or how we are able to help our patients uh, with the limited resources and uh, even in the remote areas so we are basically coming to the question what i understood is how you differentiate between a flu cold and uh, covid uh, in a basic uh, clinical setup because most of the patients will be coming with the symptoms of cough shortness of breath fever fatigue running nose nasal congestion diarrhea body ache loss of appetite some respiratory symptoms some will have chills these are all basically will be there in flu it will be there in the common cold and it will be there in the uh, covid as well so uh, what is uncommon that we have to understood first uncommon is in uh, parasitic rate infections due to common cold running nose and sinus uh, this is uh, uncommon in the uh, flu and fever is uncommon in the common cold so if there is a fever and uh, more of uh, loss of appetite then loss of smell 
that kind of presentation then it more more likely into the covid and uh, in seasonal allergy aches and pains are uncommon usually they will have every seasonal uh, they will have running uh, nose running uh, wheezing then allergic other allergic manifestations as well but uh, body aches then pain is uncommon in seasonal allergy that is how we usually on clinical ground we can differentiate between flu cold and covid based on what is uncommon to the these uh, three things great dr narayana i am sure many of here also would agree that in covid basically we look for the uncommon symptoms compared to seasonal flu so we move on to dr agam vora from mumbai what symptoms do you associate or what symptoms do you consider a predictor for severe or moderate covid hi everybody thanks tatri that was fantastic question i must thank chest council of india for uh, giving us this opportunity to talk about uh, covid uh, yes we probably got chance to learn about this new disease over last 6 uh, to 8 months uh, there were a lot of confusion earlier i think things are getting little better uh, what books describe or what uh, classically is spoken on various platforms about two stages of covid you know you have the early viremic phase coming in and then you have a later phase which is a hyperimmune phase or a cytokine storm coming in i have slight difference of opinion here i see three different varieties of presentation i see one variety where it is a classical delayed pattern where you have a first viremic phase and a second uh, hyperimmune phase which i see in very small proportion of patient what i see is there is one variant where viremic phase and a hyperimmune phase happen simultaneously there is another phase where just in 2 to 3 days of viremic phase the hyperimmune phase starts and then there is this classical phase which is described or spoken often about is the conventional phase where after about 5 to 7 days there is a uh, you know a hyperimmune phase not unusual for us to see interleukins in hundreds not unusual for us to see crps in hundreds on day 1 or day 3 of uh, presentation i think these are the cases where there is both uh, immune uh, reaction as well as the viral reaction what you are saying dr atri is right uh, what kind of things would predict whether patient would move from mild to moderate or severe variety and i think patients with you know upper symptoms that is loss of smell loss of taste and then probably only uh, upper cough are the patient who may not really go into severe phase but if patient has to begin with high grade fever or if patient has to begin with shortness of breath or if patient has probably cough which is really bothersome these are the patient one needs to watch for and more so if your this patient have underlying comorbidities you are in trouble in the sense if this patient has got diabetes if patient has got underlying copd somehow allow me to share that i did not see the kind of fear i had for my copd patient or the fear i had for my interstitial lung disease patient be it their own fear their own limitation their own home bound status that they did not get disease but somehow i did not in mumbai at least see a lot of copd suffering i was i was really anxious ke what happens if my copd patients get covid uh, you know their course would be really bad so i had handful of my copd patient who got uh, covid only handful of ilds who got uh, you know covid uh, this time but yes if your patient has got underlying comorbidities probably these are the cases we need to be extra watchful thank you great so here there are two points one is anyone more symptomatic at diagnosis has a chance of going to severe secondly per se copd or per se ild need not necessarily culminate into severe so taking the question from here to dr mani maran uh, it, what it, is it i can oh i am quite clear so looking at the comorbid conditions is very important so any patient who's age is more than 60 having a comorbid conditions hypertension diabetes cardiovascular and obesity those are the uh, people who are really you need to watch for so they can you know those are the red flag uh, you know uh, sign i mean in those patients you need to have uh, have a real watch yeah you can go for the hyperimmune response yeah so dr mani maran as we have migrated to comorbidities 
so what is your experience with comorbidities in covid with respect to symptoms good evening everyone uh, first of all i would like to thank chess council of india for giving me this opportunity uh, coming back to question it's a good question atri usual comorbidities we see in our practice is uh, diabetes obesity is one of the uh, comorbidity is those who have a severe form of disease also chronic kidney disease and uh, particularly old age people uh, only young people and middle age people have typical symptoms those who have comorbidities may not have a typical symptoms uh, especially old age people they can have a non specific symptoms like uh, uh like gi non specific gi symptoms like loose stools or loss of appetite and uh, unusual tiredness those things uh young people typically they will have a fever body ache uh, cough cold those sort of thing uh so according to the presentation if they have a severe sort of pneumonia the presentation usually changes especially the shortness of breath those things great since comorbidity is so important so i am asking dr ravi dosi have you found any comorbidity associated with milder forms or the other way around any comorbidity that can predict a severe or fatal form yeah uh, first of all a big thanks to cci its founding members dr krishna sir and to all of its members that we are able to have this special webinar today uh coming back to the question dr atri comorbidities uh, it's way, it's a very interesting question that you asked that can comorbidities be a predictor of how mild goes or how it becomes moderate or severe well definitely if you look at a patient who comes to then opd and you find that he is carrying two three files with him uh, you get scared straight away ki yaar ye to gadbad hone wali hai so uh i would say mostly patients suffering from diabetes uh, and that too in diabetes those who are on uh, insulin therapy then those who have undergone ptca uh, post cavg people then uh, particularly patients suffering from malignancy on chemotherapy uh, patients who have undergone transplant all of these situations you definitely know even if it is starting with mild your patient is smiling ki sab home isolation mein ho jayega you very well know is just a matter of call when you will have to book a bed for this guy in the hospital so uh, uh, the real alarming sign is when an elderly or let's say even a 50 plus a uh, male or female comes to you with diabetes cardiac disease i think let it be mild you have to be prepared for it turning very soon to moderate or severe so basically from the previous two responses and the contribution by dr sonia i would understand that anyone with diabetes especially uncontrolled or insulin is a big warning anyone with a prior coronary artery disease especially in ptc is a big no no and in general anyone with a pre existing medical history should be something to watch for and i am sure all our viewers would agree to this now moving on from the clinical symptoms to the investigations my question to dr sonia what tests you use for diagnosing covid Dr. Sonia, your mic is muted. Please unmute. Am I audible now? Yeah, great. Am I audible? Yeah. Okay. Good evening. Greetings from Gujarat, which is at the moment under the thunder jaw of COVID post festivities. Uh, actually, honestly, this pandemic has uh, uh, brought us uh, under the flood of. you know lots of guidelines informations and clinical studies in the last 8 to 9 months honestly we all are living under the umbrella of the term called info epidemic uh but i would reiterate and like to say to everyone that please take each and every patient as they come do the perfect clinical assessment of each and every patient in a different way and come to a conclusion on the uh we know ji did she get this 
I think she's lost connection. Okay, by by the time the connectivity comes in, I am moving to the next question. We shall again come back to her. Uh, see, COVID has affected all of us in various ways adversely, and Kerala, which was a hot spot for tourism, God's own country. Especially looking at the background by Dr. Narayana Pradeep, we are all missing it. Hello. Praying that Corona gets over. Oh, Dr. Sonia, you have come back. Yeah, please continue. I'm sorry, I just lost the yeah. So, uh, as, I, as I I don't know where I was lost. So, as I was trying to say that, uh, do the assessment on of the patient clinically. Do a perfect investigation. Yes, you can use the clinical trials. and the uh, studies as the reference but the assessment clinically is very important so as far as the investigations are concerned the gold standard is rt pcr uh, and if the rt pcr is positive that means your patient is positive highly specific test and it is also sensitive uh, but most importantly the swab which needs to be taken has to be taken from the nasopharyngeal as well as from the oropharyngeal areas uh, if rt pcr comes negative and if uh, there is a strong clinical suspicion on the clinical grounds as dr narayana pradeep has alluded uh, that the patient might have covid then you might get a radiological in, uh, investigative modality in term, in form of hr ct uh, if the patient comes uh, with sari like symptoms in the triage area or in the emergency department and uh, i hope i'm audible yes Hello? yes ma'am yes, yes. ma'am very much okay some connectivity issue don't worry so as we were referring to kerala dr narayana pradeep uh, we shall come back to madam's question but for you yeah madam you had told us that rt pcr is the diagnostic and sometimes even if rt pcr is negative we need to depend on the clinical symptoms and sari then we got cut off so yes so so the clinical uh, symptom and the only thing is very important thing is the collection modality for the rt pcr which is very important has to be collected from the nasopharyngeal as well as the oropharyngeal swab the medium has to be the viral medium and the transport time should be less so these are very important to have a good yield of rt pcr however if it turns out to be negative you can get an hr ct done if the patient with uh, presents with sari and is in the triage area with some desaturation and you don't have time and you have to decide where you want to admit your patient uh, then the very fruitful test is rapid antigen test whose turn around time is 15 minutes if the rapid antigen test turns out to be positive there is no need to for covid rt pcr because then the specificity of rapid antigen test is very much high in the tunes of 90% if the patient comes after 7 days of the illness 7 to 8 days of illness and the rt pcr is negative you might as well think of getting a covid antibody test because at the end of 7 to 8 days there would be a presentation of uh, antibodies and there will be some immune response if the patient is covid and patient probably would have an igm which would probably come up at the end of the 7th or 8th day so rt pcr if rt pcr is negative you can consider doing a ct scan rapid antigen test which is highly specific however the sensitivity is between 45 to 55% or if the patient has a delayed presentation you can also do an antibody test great madam uh, dr narayan you have a diagnosed covid patient mind it a non severe diagnosed covid patient so what other investigation you advise now the mild cases uh, uh, as we know um, from the uh, tragamore and our other discussions we have to monitor them basically we have to see whether the whether they are deteriorating or will they improve with the without any problems so we it is always better to have a basic investigations like uh, cbc uh, routine blood uh, uh, rbs liver function test rft and chest x ray these are the basic uh, investigations uh, i would uh, do and i will also do a d dimer Uh, and uh, sputum hfb and gene expression cuff uh, 
symptomatics so this is basic investigations then uh, depending on the symptoms i will go for an hrct then uh, for serum ferritin and other markers of inflammation thank you so Dr. usually basic investigations uh, uh, basic chest x ray basic blood investigations are must for any covid patients thank you dr narayana taking one step forward dr agam is there some same investigation for all or in some cases you would advise some extra testing dr agam i think <clears throat> i think uh, most of these uh, investigations would be the same in the sense you are looking at uh, a development of hyperimmune phase in my opinion the virus is not really very bad it is the virus capacity to pitch your immune system and and induce uh, the hyperimmune state or the immune reaction which is so creating a problem, problem with the and then most sense. of the investigations are directed towards identifying whether this patient is going into hyperimmune phase and i would do the standard investigation that is your uh, inflammatory markers and all your inflammatory markers that is ldh crp d dimers and interleukin 6 and serum ferritin levels i prefer to do it on day 3 or day 5 depending on patient's presentation severity and uh, you know since we are talking about mild to moderate cases i would do it probably on day 3 or day 5 and uh, you know so if the patient does not simple probably i don't think i would need any further investigation okay so to sum up for the diagnosis rt pcr is the correct gold standard but the method of sample collection is very important in severe cases in an emergency situation the rapid antigen test is the fastest test available in 15 minutes and a ct scan can give us a idea of suspicion in severe cases and if there is a delayed presentation then we can go for a blood test for antibody after 7 days once we have diagnosed covid we should go for routine investigation to know the baseline cbc kft chest x ray and if we are thinking of worsening or as you told if there are certain comorbidities then we should go for crp d dimer if needed they can be repeated on day 3 day 5 great now dr manimara how do you categorize your cases as asymptomatic mild or moderate actually the asymptomatic mild and moderate asymptomatic usually the patients attenders those those uh, family members uh, can be passed to they'll uh, apart from that our is a corporate hospital so many patient and also is a trauma center so many patient uh, who come for trauma injury or any other elective surgeries uh, incidentally they will be positive so they also will be considered as asymptomatic and uh, mild category usually uh, one to three days of uh, fever cold or malaise sore throat and the this juice or a juice or all those things after that they may not be symptomatic and moderate symptoms those who are having uh, lower respiratory tract symptoms like uh, persistent cough shortness of breath and uh, on examination definitely they will be having a uh, desaturation up to maybe 94 we can consider as a moderate also they should be uh, they'll be having some mild consolidation on the chest x ray so these are the common usual presentations in case of asymptomatic mild or moderate category thank you dr manivaran see in the lockdown we all had to reconsider life and we all made certain things to do when things unlock and one of the things which was is a visit to indor which is often considered as the headquarters of indian history indian heritage so dr ravi who is having a quality time at indor do you give any profile access to contacts of your positive patients actually uh, a very interesting question and very nicely framed also and you are welcome to indore any time uh, see uh, profile access to contacts is one thing which is a very i would say uh, though krishna sir has asked us to be a political but it is one thing which is really controversial why because see all you can what you really know works is wearing a mask social distancing and isolation 
नाइंटी परसेंट ऑफ द अटेंडर्स विल कम अलॉन्ग विद द फैमिली मेंबर हैव ऑलरेडी स्टार्टेड दमसेल्स ऑन डॉक्सी आइवरमेक्टिन दे हैव ऑलरेडी स्टार्टेड सम पर्टिकुलर फॉर्मुलेशन फ्रॉम आयुर्वेदा दे हैव ऑलरेडी स्टार्टेड ड्रिंकिंग सम पर्टिकुलर स्पेशल फॉर्मुलेशन सो प्रॉब्लम इज यू डोंट नीड टू एडवाइज इट मोस्ट पीपल विल बी एडवाइजिंग यू कि डॉक्टर साहब ये ले लेना चलेगा क्या but uh, the common advices which i get i will say is that doxy ivermectin works in as prophylaxis some people say ki sab um, uh, that uh, proposed regimen by i think one of the uh, this thing uh, state boards was of ivermectin only on day 1 day 3 and day 21 uh, then again uh, some people have even gone to the extent who are really uh, i would say google savvy have even started taking favipravir as a prophylactic so i am not supporting anything of this but this is what is actually happening so uh, frankly speaking i hardly prescribe anything except wearing a mask social distancing using proper sanitization as prophylaxis but commonly if somebody is really uh, bent upon it i would like to prescribe him 5 days of doxycycline and 3 days of ivermectin just like thank you it can i want to add clear than this oh dr agam you had a take yes please <laughs> i i completely agree with uh, what ravi bhai said about uh, prophylaxis we, we really do not much know about prophylaxis but then uh, see hydroxychloroquine came and lot of people took hydroxychloroquine uh, uh then there were conflicting reports conflicting papers and then probably current stand would be high risk uh, population could take it if they have no underlying uh, uh, you know uh, contraindications to taking it we have seen patients taking hydroxychloroquine for donkey's years without developing any side effect and etc uh, though debatable i believe discussion on hydroxychloroquine there ivermectin i have a soft corner and uh, you know under the banner of academy of advanced medical education we have uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, looked into ivermectin and have looked at proposing ivermectin for four population matlab mean, four category of uh, patients you know one is say you have a sputum or you have a confirmed case sputum you have a covid confirmed case in your family and rest of the family members you have covid warriors like you and me you have uh, say you have a zone so your building has got five patients of uh, covid positive and you are high risk patient in that uh, building living and then of, of course the high risk population i think uh, ivermectin may have a role there ivermectin given in the dose of 200 to 300 microgram per kilogram day one to be repeated after 72 hours to be repeated after 72 hours and then once in a month is what is uh, being recommended is what is being studied you and me also have taken sepsivac you know mycobacterium w and uh, I, i remember uh, atri you taking it i remember uh, probably pradeep also has taken i know i'm not too sure about ravi but lot of us uh, have taken it i have taken it bijal has taken it i have given it to all my uh, department uh, doctors who are working uh, for covid a big granuloma is formed on my shoulder here but then i i have a soft corner for uh, all these immuno modulators and i have a feeling that uh, mycobacterium w or uh, you know sepsivac also works so I, when it comes to prophylaxis i think i would give my opinion in favor for all these uh, modalities of course what ravi said about mask social distancing goes without saying steam inhalation is something i would recommend to all my colleagues i do steam inhalation after taking rounds in each hospital wherever you know i go finish off my covid rounds come out and then i i take uh, good steam inhalation so these are the few things which may have uh, a role to play thank you this is just one very final very point sir uh, advising <laughs> advising prophylaxis is time at times looks to be being over optimistic you know that yaar chal de dete hopefully kuch to hoga okay so i would request the opinion of every speaker on this very important burning question dr narayana quickly your take on prophylaxis not much sure. okay so uh we have heard that the largest jewelry businessman and the largest textile businessman in india 
are currently patients of Dr. Sonia, who is having a very privileged position in India currently. So, Dr. Sonia, first your take on prophylaxis, and next the question for you: How would you treat this asymptomatic positive with or without comorbidity? Means someone had a hand fracture, or someone had a neck or femur fracture, or someone had an acute abdomen, and on routine testing came out positive. So, what would be your take on treatment of this gentleman lady with or without comorbidities? Before that, your take on co prophylaxis. So, I have a different view on the prophylaxis. Honestly, I tray. I mean, uh, there have been lot of clinical uh, trials. Again, I'm not watching on all those things, but we have seen that uh, none of those prophylaxis have probably worked. So. I myself had taken hydroxychloroquine in May and June, but I have now stopped, and I am probably not endorsing taking all those things. Yes, I do agree with Ravi that uh, the SMS, that is social distancing, masking, and uh, uh, I mean sanitization works, but not, not nothing else probably does work as prophylaxis. To be very honest, so I have a different view on that. Uh, as far as the asymptomatic patients are concerned, yes, all the Patients who are asymptomatic should go in isolation. So, yeah, I mean, they have to be, they have to self-isolate themselves and self-quarantine if they are not having any symptom whatsoever. Uh, the patients who don't have a comorbidity, however, they have to be taught to look at the red flag signs in terms of fever, new onset cough or excruciating cough, breathlessness. They should also be asked that whenever they feel heaviness in the chest. Or feel breathless, monitor the saturations. They also need to be taught to do a six-minute walk test. Most importantly, what we do is we tell them we also do a teleconsultation. By the way, I mean Dr. Agam and I were probably the first to have a webinar on teleconsultation in the month of May, and ever since we probably started doing teleconsultations for asymptomatic patients. So we do teleconsultations once in 48 to 72 hours with all the asymptomatic patients. Talking with them, assessing them, looking at their saturations. Yes, if the patient has comorbid conditions, then it is probably you know assessment on individual cases. They can probably be admitted at the COVID care center or a hospital affiliated COVID hotels where they can be monitored by a paramedic staff in terms of uh, you know uh, the saturations, the uh, new onset of symptoms, but. Uh, that is how I don't treat them. I mean, uh, we don't treat them uh, with uh, uh, any uh, treatment or any therapeutic modalities as far as asymptomatic patients are concerned. Good observation for uh, comorbid conditions and taking care of the underlying comorbid condition is the key for the management of an asymptomatic COVID. Thank you. So, when we are hearing people who have treated 25,000 plus patients, and if you look at the attendance, that the number is over 1 lakh. All of them say that the best profile access is SMS. And in fact, any government, national government, state government, they are also endorsing the same. So this should be the message to everyone. The best profile access is SMS. Everything is subject to conjecture. So we move on to Dr. Narayana. How would you treat a mild case? Uh, Satri, uh, basically there is uh, uh, um, uh, symptomatic and mild, there is very small uh, border. Uh, so uh, we, uh, first and foremost is they should be isolated, they should be quarantined and uh, they should be watched for warning signs. These are the basic things. And uh, symptomatic treatment is very important and uh, treatment of comorbidities. If they are having hypertension, diabetes, uh, uh, we have to treat them. Many other uh, illnesses, we have to treat them. And mainly monitoring and uh, uh, we have to observe them for at least for 10 days, 14 days. We are, they should be under our strict uh, either uh, 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 directly under us or through our health uh, workers or through... Uh, they should be under quarantine and under observation. That is what our policy is. And uh, symptomatically, we treat them. I treat with Montelicast if, uh, if they have uh, supposed to be an anti-inflammatory drug as well for cough symptomatics, then um, 
if they are having a uh, depending on the investigations if they are uh, having some uh, any uh, particular things accordingly we will treat them that is what i feel and oral uh, steroids or oral anticoagulation depending upon the d dimers and other uh, parameters and the chest x ray we have to look into and see see whether there is in uh, pneumonia or not thank you dr narayana here i would want to mention to our viewers that what dr narayana says dr narayana is basically working in the government in kerala and he has been in the lead when covid was creating mayhem in kerala so basically what they did it was totally endorsed by the government and it definitely helped because it was done in the public sector so dear friends please remember the words of dr sonia and dr narayana that in asymptomatic to mild basically we need to know whether the patient can monitor for the symptoms or not if there is any worsening or progressing of symptoms it is important otherwise symptomatic is the key so uh, moving on to dr agam here i would want to share that mumbai happens to be one of the most favorite city of my wife because she is in love with the sea and the mountain and mumbai is a city where there is both sea and the mountain in the same city so she keeps on finding excuses to take me to mumbai so dr agam under what circumstances will you admit a mild case interesting admitting a mild case <clears throat> one there are patients who are really very anxious there are patients who want to get admitted for the fear of not getting bed if their condition deteriorates and then you have no option but to you know admit them that's one second patients who have comorbidities even if it is mild i would not hesitate in admitting this patient if facility permits in the sense if patient can afford it or in the uh, setup where uh, uh, you know there are uh, uh, how do i put it less uh, uh, costly options are available and patient uh, probably gets bed in those hospital or if patient do it is mild has got bad cough or if he is uh, do his saturation uh, may not be uh, low but he is really symptomatic so all those patients who are more symptomatic more worried more anxious even if they are in mild category i would admit uh, this patient and all those patients who got high risk obesity who got a big surgery is okay thank you dr aka another question on admission dr mani maran would you recommend treating a moderate case at home or hospital under what circumstances dr mani maran uh, there is some ah uh, dr mani maran yeah. with login uh, before that Uh, the the stipla people are resolving a connectivity issue ah dr mani maran you have logged in yeah 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 the question for you yeah there is a moderate case and would you recommend treating this person at home or at hospital yes and no uh, yes for those who are no comorbidities are very mild symptoms even though they are moderate cases they are not having much of symptoms with the Uh, saturation up to 94 usually i'll suggest uh, home care also but uh, those i've suggested are colleagues of uh, relations of my colleagues those are medical background so they can uh, monitor them properly or close friends and those who are not willing okay and uh, and also i'll suggest no if they have any comorbidities or old age those people i won't suggest home admission home care so far uh, many people have suggested home care they all are doing well and they recovered well no come up, no morbid mortalities or no hospital admission they required so far thank you for very clear answers from dr agam we can understand that sometimes we must respect the patient's desire to get admitted sometimes in comorbidity for a wave of caution we must admit them even if their symptoms are low so moving on to dr ravi dosi 
how do you manage moderate covid cases uh, a very crisp and clear cut question and uh, i would say moderate covid cases is uh, the most satisfying aspect of managing covid cases in the icu because they are those where you give things and they work uh, see moderate cases the primarily and most important thing to start with i would feel is uh, injectable remdesivir and oxygen to begin with you have to monitor their vitals their sugar levels their saturations very very effectively their temperature has to be monitored and paracetamol administered if temperature more than 100 uh apart from your remdesivir you need a low molecular weight heparin uh and maybe in a bd dose or a long standing 24 hour one low molecular weight heparin you need to give a steroid you need to give either a dexamethasone or solumedrol and in case your patient is diabetic or not diabetic you need the sugar to be monitored regularly kyunki patient admit corona se hota hai par dusre teesre din wo diabetic ban jata hai meri sugar to 500 par chali gayi then after that you have to give a good broad spectrum antibiotic uh, it can be anything of your choice uh, in a patient with comorbidities you may prefer something higher end like a carbapenem or if your patient is relatively free of comorbidities in the middle group you can go for a a, a broad spectrum penicillin a extended spectrum penicillin uh, or a cephalosporin third generation injectable then you uh, one very compulsory aspect is giving injectable pantoprazole a lot of uh, covid patients have hiccups so you need to uh, cover the pantoprazole and uh, the domperidone part very very carefully now coming to the part where your routine management goes away and the special management comes in then you have plasma therapy convalescent plasma therapy in moderate cases i is uh, i prefer it quite a lot because i have seen very good results with it then uh, one another thing is you have to be uh, on the lookout of adding immunomodulators which agam sir likes very much i use a lot of thymosin alpha i use uh, sepsivac to a huge extent uh, and definitely that is what uh, and yeah parenteral fluid iv fluid with some multivitamin and you need to add multivitamin and protein powders also because see moderate Uh, covid is one satisfying experience where whatever you give your patient actually translates into a very sick to a very stable and healthy patient uh, this is a very important question so i would request opinion of our remaining panelists dr mani maran anything you would want to add to what dr ravi covered yeah. okay. can i add uh, yeah, dr sonia please ma'am so uh, let me uh, the merchants and the textile businessmen <laughs> no so, uh, so most important uh, thing that we need to remember is the exact timing of you know introduction of the therapeutic agents in the patient which is very important uh, as uh, the moderate is considered you know there is a definition of a moderate disease where the patient has you know a saturation which is going below 90 95 so it's 94 92 so that's the right time that you probably execute the use of remdesivir remdesivir should not be used in the mild patients of so doing too much early is causing harm again no steroids unless you document desaturation in a patient which is very important and a monitoring all the inflammatory parameters along with the clinical you know symptoms and signs is very important so and assessing the patient every day so the correct timing of introduction of the drug is very important and most important thing is using less is doing really good to the patient rather than using aggressively and doing more harm great so to sum up for all our listeners over here covid is a disease where up till now we don't know what is the exact cure so basically and the guidelines are still in the modification amendments every week basically our aim should be not to do harm and our aim should be to give relief to the patient so if you are admitting someone with the view that he or she should not deteriorate you are actually helping the person if you are giving anything for symptom relief which is you are actually helping the person so to come to the next question dr sonia your take on antibiotics 
in non severe covid means mild to moderate covid so basically you know antibiotics are used for bacterial infections and they are not at all meant for the viral infections so uh, in a mild case who are on isolation i probably would just give symptomatic treatment so if they are coughing i would give them antitus 7 if they have a fever probably an antipyretics however if i admit the patient right when the patient is admitted a uh, antibiotic can be prescribed to prevent infection in the hospital but uh, you know giving an uh, antibiotic as a ceftriaxone or maybe a cipoprazone would be enough for me rather than you know loading them with a very high uh, end antibiotics to be honest uh, to begin with so we can summarize that in covid fever can be considered a deficiency of ceftriaxone <laughs> it's not this the fever has i mean all fevers are not to be treated with antibiotics etc you know exactly. great ma'am chal so dr narayana any deterioration or adverse effect you would attribute to antibiotic use in covid usually no uh, but we have seen some rashes with the doxycycline usage oral doxycycline and um, uh, second thing is over confidence that you have given something and if you do not monitor them properly there is one chance that suddenly they may you may miss it it is not actually you may feel like one day once around is enough you need not to see them because they are all well protected but such sometimes they are it becomes over confident and you may end up with some complication otherwise routinely we don't see much complications <clears throat> Uh, thank you so what important message coming out from here is if we are prescribing doxycycline to someone we should request to look for rashes great dr agam your take on steroids both systemic or inhaled in non severe covid sir unmute please when yeah. yes if there is one drug which has got very strong evidence for its use and that is steroid especially dexamethasone but i'm sure everybody here would agree any steroid will have its action when it comes to severe covid your question is the role in milder covid or moderate covid yes i would consider using uh, it in moderate covid provided patient is going into a hyperimmune phase so yes i would consider that in mild covid i would consider using steroid for few indications one if patient has got severe i mean uh, fever which doesn't come under control with good dose of paracetamol if my patient has got bad cough you know i feel patient is in mild covid but then he has got bad cough yes i would consider using steroid if patient is given some treatment like say doxycycline for example and patient develops rash yes i would use uh, steroid for sure if patient has got underlying disease which demands steroids say my stable interstitial lung disease or a patient of uh, said difficult to control asthma was on uh, oral steroid probably i would continue uh, steroids in those situations i have not found in my limited experience i have not found inhaled steroids of much use a uh, lot of my colleagues uh, have uh, found inhaled uh, steroids of much use but in my limited understanding i feel covid does not really itch airways it is not a airway disease it is a parenchymal disease it is a lung disease and what we see commonly with influenza we are not seeing with covid so i see less of airway involvement in covid i see less of bacterial infection in covid i see very few streptococcal uh, infections uh, in uh, covid contrary to influenza i would see every severe influenza getting streptococcal infection here it is not happening so that is slightly different than previous experience so i would use steroids in mild to moderate covid provided they have some drug reaction they have underlying need for steroid or they have symptoms which are not controlled with the conventional medicines thank you okay we all are missing something or other in this covid era and dr mani maran here he is missing his tennis matches dr mani maran is also a accomplished tennis player who is missing his tennis matches due to covid so dr mani maran yeah. any adverse effect you came across in patient prescribed steroid for non severe covid non severe covid not much of uh, uh, many people are using uh, but only thing is a first week they should not use definitely it's going to backfire second week it's acceptable uh, 
but not much of adverse effects except mild pedal edema or uh, facial puffiness mm-hmm. but problem we are encountering is up to even the non severe covid if the patient stopping steroids they have a lot of non specific symptoms like uh, they can't have much of appetite or they will have a cough anything so slowly we are tapering down definitely uh, they will be much better and uh, at least we require 3 to 4 weeks of steroid in those patients in the tapering dose withdrawal symptoms are main apart from other symptoms great thank you so from the above two questions we understand that steroids do help in symptom control and steroids should be stopped gradually or tapered so our next question to dr ravi doshi your take on ivermectin hydroxychloroquine in non severe covid uh see uh, it's been a while that i have used hydroxychloroquine very frankly speaking uh, severe gastritis some cardiac issues uh, made us to stop use hydroxychloroquine almost some 2 3 months ago and then there it was became controversial also with lot of conflicting uh, data coming in so uh, initially march to uh, march to june july lot of hydroxychloroquine uh, we used in non severe covid uh but uh, the subsequently personally the use of hydroxychloroquine has gone down significantly i still don't find a very uh, very strong role for it very frankly speaking uh, then uh, more maybe some people you might advise on an opd basis in mild cases but definitely not in moderate then uh, coming to ivermectin i i prescribe ivermectin uh, in mild moderate and severe everything because i still believe a lot in ivermectin and uh, the three uh, the three day dosing single dosing makes it very convenient to be used in mild and moderate cases and um, uh, i i think that's pretty much i have to say on it great dr sonia madam adverse effect encounter due to ivermectin or hydroxychloroquine so uh, as dr ravi said we have stopped using uh, hydroxychloroquine for quite a long time now the last we used was probably in may and june uh, we have not encountered much of side effects with hydroxychloroquine however just to you know uh, say that we had one patient who had a qt prolongation but then at that time we probably also had given patient lopinavir and ritonavir at that time so we not sure that when we have been using hydroxychloroquine for a lot of our ctd patients and we have not encountered much of a problems so there was only one patient which was probably you know uh, given lopinavir and ritonavir and so the combination and drug drug interaction might have caused a drug uh, i mean qt prolongation uh, as far as ivermectin is concerned uh, yes we have encountered some sort of headache uh, nausea pain in abdomen but then you know probably that can be even because of the disease itself so it's very difficult to probably you know pinpoint that this is probably because of the drug when you say it's a safe drug to be you know given however there are certain contraindications it should probably be given with a you know a pinch of salt when the patient is asthmatic or with a pinch of salt when the patient is pregnant that's the only uh, thing that i want to say about ivermectin so from these two questions we understand that ivermectin is something safe it de- oh dr ravi yes sir please one one very important point like ma'am uh, also pointed the fact that post may june the use of hydroxychloroquine has come down one very important fact is post may june use of remdesivir has increased and there is this remdesivir hydroxychloroquine they don't mingle well it seems so you are not supposed to use both of them together so that is also one point where when an, as and as our remdesivir use increased automatically our hydroxychloroquine use uh, came down that was also one very point point i thought we should share i i want to add something can i yeah, yeah. definitely please please continue uh <clears throat> fevipiravir uh, since it is made available and since the cost has come down probably has gained acceptance uh, what atri i mean what was discussed by uh, ravi bhai was absolutely uh, uh, you know has been my experience as well we also started with enough uh, uh, doxycycline ivermectin news we also started with enough hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin or other macrolide uh, uh, you know experience but 
when fevipiravir was made uh, easily available and became reasonably uh, you know priced the use increased and i have come to the understanding that even for mild variety of uh, covid if my patient has got underlying comorbidities probably i would not hesitate in using fevipiravir up front in fact i have i have uh, a developed the opinion in the panel we have this question in the panel okay thank thank you we'll take it up that time dr nagayana you had mentioned about something about monte lucast so your take on monte lucast and mucolytics in non severe covid um uh, basically monte lucast is a cystinyl leukotriene uh, receptor antagonist it has got an anti inflammatory effect as well it suppresses the oxidative stress and reduce the effect cytokine production and uh, so i feel it may help in uh, in the initial stages of disease progression as an anti inflammatory where it can prevent some amount of cytokine production as well so i personally feel montelicast has uh, beneficial when the patient is having cough as well has a, another symptom as well this oh. is my uh, personal uh, take oh. on monte lucas any adverse effect encountered due to monte lucas mucolytics so only the increase in the cough because of mucolytics because uh, you know as uh, dr uh, agam has rightly said there is no airway involvement to be very honest we use mucolytics as antioxidants or however they have some mucolytic activity as well so patient probably would have increase in the dry cough so i mean that's the only thing which we have encountered okay dr mani maran uh, we were discussing fevipiravir a little while ago so your take on fevipiravir in non severe covid connectivity dr mani maran फेविप्रेवर के बारे में तो अगम सर ही बोलेंगे लगता है नहीं हम अगम सर से भी पूछेंगे बट लेट्स नो बट फेविप्रेवर इज एनीवे नॉट सो सीवियर कोविड यू नो यू वुड कंसीडर इट ओनली फॉर माइल्ड टू मॉडरेट डिजीज डॉक्टर मनी मारन आर वी ऑडिबल या डॉक्टर मनी मारन योर टेक ऑन फेविप्रेवर अरे आई नेवर यूज्ड फेविप्रेवर <laughs> oh so no issue. great great now agam sir i had interrupted you very rudely on fevipiravir <laughs> <laughs> no no uh, fevipiravir i have a extra uh, soft corner i believe that fevipiravir works and it works pretty well provided all antivirals uh, you know i mean everybody here would agree with our uh, previous experience of influenza also that would work very well if started very early in the course of disease so if you happen to start fevipiravir uh, on you know second third fourth day probably you will see excellent results you could start fevipiravir till 11th or 12th day if patient is symptomatic if you feel patient is in viremic uh, phase in that situation very limited cases i have where i have started fevipiravir that late but in mild to moderate cases you could consider that in fact i have stopped using uh, doxy ivermectin combination i have stopped using uh, hcq azithromycin as everybody discussed earlier but i have started using fevipiravir very very uh, you know routinely in all moderate cases in most of the mild cases i you you can never swear and say that this patient will remain mild on you know if this patient may progress to moderate it may be just the phase from mild to moderate you may have uh, seen that patient and in this situation probably we would not take chance so anybody only see if if patient like you comes in you know who has got no blood pressure no diabetes uh, no otherwise risk factors hell and hearty otherwise not healthcare uh, uh, you know warrior i would i would think of uh, putting them on no treatment would just give you uh, immunomodulators like zinc or vitamins etc etc but otherwise all patients i think i would give them fevipiravir with today's understanding and today's availability of drug thank you okay uh, dr ravi sir adverse effect attributed to fevipiravir uh, adverse effects uh, attributed to fevipiravir surprisingly are a very few Uh, notably some of them are uh, gastritis uh, some people develop some pimples on the forehead and arms this i have seen uh, some very rarely uric acid uh, raised uh, in very very rare cases uh, i haven't seen anything more than that correct okay. 
So to sum up, we have seen transaminitis and hyperbilirubinemia. There is some effect on the uh, you know liver functions as well. Uh, so we, we take this opportunity to say that you know there are a lot of uh, you know we should all discourage polypharmacy because then you know there are a lot of prescriptions that we have been probably seeing from the private practitioners giving febipiravir, doxycycline, ivermectin all together. Look, probably they all have a very dicey role in the. We probably have to, you know, think of one antiviral which we want to give in our mild cases. And what we are discussing just now is these are all the role for the mild to moderate. Once the moderate or the saturation starts dropping in, this all drugs probably doesn't have any role whatsoever. So it's better that we just give only one drug at a time when you are suspecting a patient who has got mild with symptoms, which is very important. And this message should be very clear to each and everyone. Okay. So to sum up very shortly. Except pantoprazole and ranitidine, all the drugs are causing gastritis. Ivermectin is something safe. It may work, mechanism unknown. Febipiravir can be considered very early, no use in late. And if we have reached moderate, then better to think about remdesivir. In current day, HCQS and azithromycin are a big no-no. Doxycycline also should not be considered. So moving on. Dr. Sonia, your take on micronutrient replacement, micronutrients in non-severe COVID. So uh, there is no clear cut evidence that they have some therapeutic implications or they, they have probably any role on the clinical outcome in terms of viral clearance or uh, maybe you know recovery from the disease. However, they can be used as, as antioxidants or immune boosters. I'm sure Dr. Agam loves this word immune booster, you know, immunomodulator. So they can be used as immune booster, but uh, there is no clear data that they would probably have, uh, you know, clear evidence as a therapeutic intervention. Uh, yes, we have seen a lot of people using home remedies as well in, uh, in form of turmerics. Then they are also using some homeopathic medications like arsenica, album. they probably are also using, uh, you know, vitamin D3 has been probably, you know, prescribed by a lot of doctors and, and most of the prescriptions are uh, given as vitamin D3 twice or three times in a day. But these are probably all immune modulators or immune boosters. They have no therapeutic implications. I don't see any reason that they should not be prescribed. But, you know, there's no clear evidence that they have any benefit. Okay, so the main thing is currently there is no clear cut evidence of no benefit of micronutrients. Now, Dr. Narayana, your take on anticoagulants, antiplatelets in non severe COVID. Anticoagulant uh, should be prescribed very judiciously, seeing the, you, you have to monitor the patients in mild and moderate cases. You have to see the D dimer levels, and uh, if it is uh, uh, and uh, uh, any uh, basically it is a prothrombotic uh, uh, phenomenon where in the COVID. So if you are seeing a prothrombotic uh, phase uh, and if your D dimers are high, then definitely I will start on uh, anti uh, anticoagulation therapy. And regarding uh, discharge policies uh, in anticoagulation, that is the most controversial thing. And I don't prefer it unless otherwise there is a uh, definite evidence of thrombosis or thrombotic events. Great. So basically we understand that unless there is definite, documented, it should not be given empirically. Thank you. The next question is tailor made for Dr. Agam, who happens to treat lots of actors, models, cricketers. And I'm sure your patients also ask you this question. What is your take on diet and exercise in non-severe COVID? By looking at me, I think they reframe their question, you know. <laughs> Exercises and diet probably run far away from me. I myself weigh about 100 kg uh, with absolutely no hair on scalp. So it is only my weight, you know, no add-on weight. Uh, so nobody generally asks me about this question. Uh, no, but I, I get your point. See, as I believe, uh, as uh, Sonia was talking about immunomodulation, which is very close to my heart, I believe any disease has got a disease factor that is a bug factor and of course the host factor. You know, Atri, I was excited in second MBBS when I read the definition of tuberculosis for the first time. You know, what does this definition say? 
the definition says tuberculosis is the reaction of human host tissue to presence and multiplication of mycobacterium tuberculosis and hence tuberculosis is not what mycobacterium does to you it is actually what you do to mycobacterium tuberculosis is the disease state and i was so excited about it you know it is no point blaming dust when asthmatic gets exacerbation there is no point in blaming that uh, you know anopheles when you get uh, malaria i i understand these are the insulting agents but actual disease development depends on your immunity and if we can modulate your immunity you know you you would swear by me and say that all these reactions or all these mortalities that we are seeing are mainly because of immune reaction you know viremic phase is mild unless we have a multi system involvement and again which is hyperimmune and cytokine related etc it is all immunity which is playing a role your diet your nutrition your belief in therapy definitely works you know how does this gayatri mantra works you know that's my favorite uh, thing i tell patients to chant uh, whichever god they believe in how does it work it all works at that uh, you know level where uh, all this immunity is modulated so i strongly believe that if you believe in uh, diet if you believe in exercise it works it doesn't work just when you say if if patient does not believe in exercise patient does not believe in diet control and just you superimpose those ideas in them it may not work as well but if you believe in it if patient believes in it if they have faith in this particular therapy everything that you offer works thank you okay so one very important point all of us doctors over here we were health coaches but now we should also become mental coaches means we should convince our patient that if you believe in the therapy it is going to work great answer great revelation for all of us dr mani manan we are treating a patient of covid what follow up investigations you advise between the time of positive to the time of negative any investigations on follow up dr mani maran you got my question yeah yeah you got it usually for follow up those uh, who have mild symptoms or improving symptoms we we'll last for routine investigation like uh, chest x ray and uh, inflammatory markers those things those who are persistent or uh, moderate symptoms usually uh, persistent symptoms usually we we'll ask for the even ct scan of the chest uh, and we have picked up uh, pulmonary embolism also even non covid case non severe patients Uh, when they had persistent symptoms, we picked up uh, pulmonary embolism in CT pulmonary angio. Uh, so, uh, so we have to be very careful. If they have mild or improving symptoms, go for routine investigation. And they have persistent symptoms, go for higher investigation. And many patients uh, want what for their satisfaction. We will do the CT scan. Uh, they want to check. Uh, the many people are now aware of uh, severe disc or alda. So we have to. They want to check. it's resolving or resolved those things and many people ask me about fibrosis also that much knowledge they have now so for their satisfaction we have to do some basic ct follow up ct and all okay uh, i can see over 100 accumulated audience questions so i have just two more questions for the panelist one to dr ravi and one to dr sonia dr ravi any routine medications you advise after the patient has turned negative uh well routine uh, medications that we advise after the patient becomes negative first of all if he is on febiprevir i would request him to complete the 14 days of febiprevir uh, i advise them pantoprazole uh, i advise them a routine broad spectrum antibiotic and uh, anticoagulation i tend to prescribe for at least 15 days uh, with no risk factors and uh, if the patient is a bit obese having risk factors i tend to prescribe it for a month or so. so uh, steroids uh, oral steroids usually for in a tapering way for 7 uh, days or 10 days i uh, tend to prescribe and vitamins particularly your uh, immunity boosters like vitamin c and zinc okay before the last question one quick trivia or quiz question to our cci life members you can answer me on our cci life member whatsapp group our indian life is defined by cinema our way of thinking is defined by cinema so which famous indian movie had predicted a covid kind of situation and in fact in fact 
predicted or prescribed a prophylaxis for the same which famous indian movie had predicted a covid like situation and in fact prescribed a prophylaxis for the same you can answer in the cci live member whatsapp group our final question of the panel before we move to the audience question dr sonia average duration from positive to negative and did you correlate any factor with prolonged positivity yeah so uh, it would take weeks for uh, from weeks to months to become from positive to negative uh, honestly 30 to 40% of uh, the patients remain positive at the end of even 3 to 4 weeks but it is very important uh, to remember one thing that the virus is effective up to 8 to 10 days only so post 10 days even if the virus has been predicted uh, picked up on an rt pcr it is a non viable virus so it's i mean and that's the reason we say that uh, the patient needs to be isolated or quarantined uh, for uh, 10 days uh, prolonged positivity probably is attributed to most of the immuno compromised status of the patient which probably uh, remains positive for quite a long time okay so before we sum up our findings for today i shall very quickly move on to the audience questions we have dr kishor jumani from mumbai is remdesivir still effective or banned i hope you have got your answer from our current discussion that in moderate early before the saturation drops in it's a very good idea and it definitely helps it definitely saves lives uh, dr jagdish antin from bangalore is it possible to diagnose i am sorry your question is on tuberculosis Atri. Atri, uh, oh, dr sonia can i add one point for remdesivir yeah dr sonia most welcome yeah so it as i said initially also it's the actual timing of the use of remdesivir which is very important so when you use the patient when he has developed a moderate disease and he requires low flow oxygen very important which has probably been documented by the you know solidarity trial also that a low flow oxygen and a moderate disease is the right time for the use of remdesivir otherwise when the remdesivir is used when the patient is on a high flow or if the patient is on a severe disease it doesn't work the jagdish in i have to allow your question because your question is on tuberculosis whereas we are talking covid today uh, op gupta location not given will there be any difference between treatment with plasma therapy and lab prepared antibodies dr narayana sir dr narayana will there be any difference between treatment with plasma therapy and lab antibodies i think uh, dr doshi will be better person to answer this he's uh, done more uh, plasma therapy than me <laughs> dr doshi uh yeah uh, well uh, see plasma therapy uh, like the question is uh, will pl plasma therapy and lab uh, made antibodies uh, will they have started using lab made antibodies which was uh, uh, which we have heard of in donald trump's case also they are told that artificial synthetic antibodies have been used so uh, the it has been shown to be more efficacious rather if used early and see convalescent plasma therapy if you give from a patient with a good antibody level where it's like a magic bullet it will actually the patient gets cured very quickly so i don't uh, means synthetic antibodies might be uh, 100% effective all the time well nothing is 100% it might be very effective all the time theoretically they look to be on the same uh, level but synthetic antibodies since the antibody titer will always be higher i feel maybe better than convalescent plasma therapy but there is a big maybe you never know anything in covid till you have tried it yourself for one or two months yeah thank you uh, dr gulab kanhoji jadav from nagpur thank you for your question but i would have to disallow this question due to political and controversial connotations why anti covid 19 vaccine is late when needed urgently we will not answer this question sir but thank you for your question Uh, miss kamini bhavsar from gurwali pada remdesivir drug effect with diabetic patients dr narayana your take sir 
रेमडेसिविर इफेक्ट विद डायबिटिक पेशेंट Yeah, um, uh, remdesivir uh, is a, uh, uh, we have used the drug and it has uh, seen good in uh, uh, patients with comorbidities like diabetes. Uh, but uh, we have to be very careful in some situations because uh, this drug itself uh, sometimes uh, causes uh, you are uh, you are not able to monitor them properly uh, and. Uh, So actual deterioration uh, when the patient uh, develops, uh, you will be in a tough time whether this drug is working or actually the disease is progressing. So you should be very cautious in such uh, situations when you are using uh, remdesivir. It's the take. Okay. Thank you, Doctor Narayana. Uh, Doctor Sumit Vadhva from Gurugram. He is a CCI life member, and I must thank him. He has a total of ten questions. it seems that he has studied like us for this webinar some of his questions have already been answered at this meeting of with and the ones which are not yet answered we will answer when you have a ct chest or chest x in covid we answer that when do you plan for initial blood in this we answer that this question is very important and i would request dr agam who you mummy who is a covid patient एंटीबायोटिक or if this patient requires home nebulization with mucolytic if there is tenacious secretion or if this patient requires bronchodilators for uh, uh, underlying copd or if this patient requires bronchodilators and steroid for the underlying asthma you would continue this treatment as it is with some care we have uh, interesting documents and we've had seminar on this as well we've had web meeting under the banner of uh, chest council of india regarding the use of nebulization therapy now nebulization per se for covid is not really indicated but yes if your doctors have advised you to continue nebulization therapy it can very well and very safely be given there are certain guidelines available there are certain do's and don'ts available for the use of nebulizer at home so far as possible this nebulization must be done in their single individual room and not many people should be uh, you know surrounding that patient while he is taking nebulization because nebulization may generate aerosols and that can probably transmit disease so far as possible the window should be open air condition should not be used and this uh, nebulizer should be clean the equipment should be clean regularly this nebulizers must not be shared amongst family members of the patient so if you take this small care i think nebulization can very well be used when required at home thank you okay uh, another question by dr sugar dr mani maran if the inflammatory markers are raised but patient is stable how do you plan further treatment usually we should treat the patient it's not the blood reports it should be clinically correlated then only we should give a importance to inflammatory markers uh, especially il6 many people are doing il6 even any other infection we have seen even tuberculosis il6 are around 5000 6000 but chest x ray will be normal ct scan will be normal so always treat the patient don't treat the reports clinically correlates then go ahead with the further management that's all. okay great answer please treat the patient and not the reports uh, vignesh from hyderabad your question has already been answered any role of azacort bujesnite fenticasone laba inhalers in covid we already answered that there is a appreciation note from dr kafil ahmed from bol who has told that very nice Pratima Singh Bhubaneswar. Definition of post-COVID. Uh, sorry, madam, we have to disallow this question. As this is basically from nine or two years before the COVID. Post-COVID shall be taken in future. But the Ashwini gave some very post-COVID. One important question. From Lake Havasu City. What is happy hypoxia? Dr. Sonia, ma'am, what is happy hypoxia? Sorry. 
So when the patient is not aware of the, his desaturation, you know, there's probably a ventilation perfusion gross mismatch. And when the patient comes in, a uh, patient is not tachypneic, patient does not have any symptoms whatsoever. And when you receive the patient in the triage, the saturations are in the uh, you know, ranges of 60s and 70s. So that's probably called a happy hypoxia when there is a huge perfusion abnormality and that's ventilation perfusion mismatch. Great. Dr. K. Satish Kumar from Hyderabad, we have already answered your question, the take on favipiravir. Dr. Sudhir Kumar, answered your question, what is the present treatment? Dr. Ajit Oke from Mumbai, again appreciation, no question, only appreciation. Thank you, sir. From Hisar, Dr. Bhushan Sudarshan Bansal, is dimer always elevated whenever there is COVID pneumonia? Dr. Ravi, sir, your take, is dimer always elevated when there is COVID pneumonia? The dimer is not always elevated when there is uh, pneumonia. There are situations where you find frank pulmonary embolism and still D-dimer levels may be very much normal. So, uh, you, your D-dimer is not a 100% uh, indicator, but yes, in, in several situations, uh, the rise in D-dimer and more importantly, the serial rise in D-dimer values help you in predicting pulmonary embolism possibility uh, very effectively. So, uh, you have to be very careful if you are suspecting critical pulmonary embolism and still uh, D-dimer is normal, better to go ahead with a CT pulmonary exam and change your COVID patient to uh, therapeutic anticoagulation. Okay, thank you sir. One question from Indore, Dr. Vinod Kumar Koyal, pulmonary fibrosis following COVID, so we shall take this question in a later seminar. Mohan Debegoda from Bengaluru. Why did some of the patients got into severe despite not having comorbidities and in some, despite comorbidities and age did not get into severe disease? Do you have to attribute to genetic susceptibility? Dr. Ryan, your take on this question. You are asking me, Edri? Okay, Dr. Sonia, why did some patients got into severe despite not having comorbidities and some patients despite comorbidity and age did not get into severe? Is there some genetic susceptibility? Dr. Sonia. I don't think so. That, should, I mean, that is something, that area which probably is still a gray area which we need to probably uh, introspect and investigate. But, uh, you know, a patient going into the severity are uh, more likely are comorbid or the elderly patients. And all those patients who present delayed presentation, who are neglecting their symptoms, uh, not coming up to the healthcare centers, are the patients who are probably going into the severity. <laughs> However, having said that, the question which probably has sprouted up, that some of the patients would go into the severity and some not, is probably an area agreed that should be... Uh, 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 Dr. Sudhakar from Bengaluru, how long it takes for COVID patients to, to regain sense of taste and smell? Dr. Narayana, are you available? This question for you. How long to regain taste of sense and smell? It greatly varies uh, uh, because uh, our first patient uh, we had in from Kerala, or uh, India's third patient was in Kasaragod, that is from the January 30th. And when the second patient came, what happened was he was told like he was working in the uh, one uh, perfume shop and uh, he had report uh, his main, he was not able to smell the uh, perfumes. That was when we reported that the loss of taste, uh, loss of smell as one of the COVID symptoms. Uh, that was early um, uh, Jan January or February that time, this is what I'm talking. Then what we observed is uh, they are uh, some patients uh, regain it very fast in uh, second or third week. Some patients uh, goes up to six weeks. It varies from two week, two to six weeks uh, in my observation. Okay, Dr. Trijit Guha from Kolkata, sir, I am known case of asthma. I work without PPE kit. How many asthma patients with COVID have you seen? What was the prognosis? I would want to answer your question, Dr. Trijit. You may be a statistics for the country and the government, but you mean the world for your family. For your family, you are everything. So please take precaution. If you are working in COVID, 
कि अस्थमा और नो अस्थमा प्लीज यूज दैट पीपीई किट सर प्लीज सेव योर सेल्फ फर्स्ट डॉक्टर फिरोज हकीम फ्रॉम दक्षिण कन्नड़ा एनी रोल ऑफ सीआरपी ट्रेंड फॉर एंटीजन नेगेटिविटी डॉक्टर अगम योर टेक एनी ट्रेंड ऑफ सीआरपी फॉर सीआरपी ट्रेंड फॉर एंटीजन टेस्ट नेगेटिविटी टिव स्टेटस many a times you see that uh, uh, this particular phase comes up with the onset of disease it may come up 3 to 5 days down the line or it may come up 7 to 10 days down the line your covid generally turns out negative 15 days uh, average it takes 10 to 15 days for covid to become negative it could remain high as high as 28 days so many a times your crp would normalize much earlier than your covid antigen becomes negative thank you pranay vinod greater noida we have already answered your question amit mumbai answered dr dinesh saraswat gaziabad answered dr vinod kumar inquire your question is on severe covid next time vicky baxi from srinagar even well controlled diabetes or hypertension controlled by medicines are prone for severe covid dr mani maran since you told us about the comorbidities this gentleman from srinagar is asking well controlled diabetes or hypertension is it also prone for severe covid yeah so uh, they are under control definitely they are at risk uh, they should be managed properly and uh, because we will be using steroids the sugar level has to be under control and uh, there yeah, there is nothing no relationship between uh, no non covid or covid condition if they are under the control they can have a severe covid okay Dr. Prajay Lunia, our life member from Mumbai, your question has already been answered. Dr. Stuti Gupta, she is one of our youngest life members from New Delhi. How exactly would IL-6 help, and shouldn't CRP ferritin suffice? Dr. Sonia, would you want to answer? Sure, Atri, and this is close to my heart. So, ah. Uh, Uh, as i said right uh, on the first uh, go itself that the assessment of the patient is very very important looking at the red flag signs looking at all inflammatory markers so only il6 per se is not the only uh, you know parameter to look for so if you want to look for the severity it has to be you know uh, you know increase in the oxygen requirement uh, sudden doubling or the tripling of the all the inflammatory parameters in terms of d dimers crp ferritin ldh as well as the il6 and honestly it doesn't make any sense if the patient is asymptomatic to do an il6 levels or in a mild case when the patient does not have any symptoms to do this inflammatory markers at all okay and uh, same question sudeep mistri barasa serum ferritin why serum ferritin done dr ravi हेलो डॉक्टर रवि वाई सीरम फेरिटिन डन फेरिटिन इज अगेन वन ऑफ द एक्यूट इंफ्लेमेटरी मार्कर्स सो ऑल ऑफ दिस एक्यूट इंफ्लेमेटरी मार्कर्स एंड दे द एचएलएच कंडीशन डायग्नोसिस ऑफ द एचएलएच कंडीशन एंड मैक्रोफेज एक्टिवेशन दे आर फैसिलिटेटेड बाय द यूज ऑफ दिस एक्यूट इंफ्लेमेटरी मार्कर्स सो दैट इज द रिलेवेंस ऑफ गेटिंग टेस्ट लाइक सीआरपी फेरिटिन एंड एलडीएच डन बेसिकली okay great uh so there are lots of questions most of them them we answered and we can anyway use our panel for further things now very quickly i would request our panelists to sum up in as short as possible dr sonia madam please sum up so uh we all are still learning about covid so we have been probably flooded with you know collage of the clinical trials and uh, the studies we are learning every day but most important thing is uh, you know uh, what i would like to reiterate again no one knows nothing everyone knows everything so very importantly you know uh, you know diagnose 
uh, properly, assess the patient correctly, do judicious investigations, do less harm by treat, you know, doing less, which is very important. And most importantly, the right timing of induction of all the therapeutic agents is very important. And please avoid polypharmacy. This is what I would like to say. Thank you, Dr. Sonia. Clear message. Dr. Narayana, your message. Yeah, SMS, uh, that is the uh, fundamental thing. Then uh, isolation and quarantine, then monitoring, assessment of the patient and don't neglect it. Uh, virus is very mild. Definitely uh, it is uh, not as uh, uh, strong as MDR bug. Vi virus is very mild, but it is the body's immune response. That is uh, or how it behaves in a various individuals is totally different. So we are still, uh, do, it is still a mystery uh, how, why it is behaving different in different individuals. So we have to monitor them. We have to uh, don't neglect it and uh, take prayer. There is nothing to worry about it. We can uh, have treat it and we can win over the virus as well. Thank you. Dr. Mani Maran, your take. Dr. Mani Maharaj. Similarly, treat the patient. Don't treat people. It correlates clinically, then treat aggressively. That's all. Dr. Agam, your message. As uh, Krishna said, you know, everything under the sun, including sun rays, we have tried in COVID. We started uh, with, uh, you know, we've tried uh, multivitamins, we've tried uh, trace elements, we've tried anti helminths we've tried antibiotics, we've tried anti-inflammatory steroids, we have tried immunomodulators, we have tried conventional uh, uh, antivirals, we have tried new antivirals, we have tried biologics, so we have tried everything possible. After about uh, six to eight months of uh, understanding, we have come to a fairly decent uh, understanding of COVID and we have realized that for mild patient, reassurance is all that is required. If mild patient is associated with comorbidities, it may be probably sensible in today's time to start them on antivirals and antivirals must be started early. For moderate to severe patient, if there are high risk patient, they should be hospitalized and in hospital management must be given. Uh, I think uh, I would give the message that mild to moderate cases must be reassured, must be given uh, uh, this uh, nutritional supplements that is immunomodulators and depending on your hospital protocols or your state protocols or if you are following the national protocols probably uh, doxy ivermectin combination versus favipiravir could be the drug of choice thank you before i move on to dr ravi i must thank so many viewers for so many questions and i apologize to the people whose questions i could not take i would request to use our cci whatsapp groups for the next two or three days to please satisfy your queries and we all are there in the groups we shall answer them don't worry dr ravi your take and a special announcement from dr ravi yeah uh, well my take on covid is very clear look at uh, what corona has taught us look at what covid has taught us it has taught us to embrace technology it has taught us it has taught us to treat our colleagues and all our hospital members with great respect. Uh, let all our family members uh, be together and understand what is the importance of togetherness. COVID, see, treating mild, moderate COVID is a really sheer patient gets okay. Severe COVID, not today's topic, but really a tough disease. What I have come to understand in COVID is not to belittle anything or any opinion today or tomorrow. We might have used for anything in any aspect of the disease. So I believe COVID has a huge role. Uh, COVID has taught us a lot of things. And it is very important to remain positive so that that positivity of COVID can be removed from your body. Now, the important announcement that has been interested to me is that the life membership uh, fees uh, effectively from uh, 14 December midnight, Agam sir's birthday, will be hiked up from 5,000 to 8,000 rupees and uh, uh, so it's a very uh, good 
all of us come and celebrate agam sir's birthday lavishly by becoming cci life members immediately if you have not become and uh, <laughs> hope this webinar convinces you to become life members even earlier uh, i would want to tell everybody uh, that uh, you know request all your friends all your colleagues to become life member of chest council of india one of the strongest medical association that i know of the association that gives you platform to interact with virtually any chest physician of the country and it is definitely without any politics it's a free platform so my my request would be to all of you to encourage at least one of your associate to become life member of the association uh the managing committee and the central council has taken a uh, very has given us time frame you know probably one month uh, time we have almost three weeks time we have to encourage members to take advantage of this discounted membership because membership is going to rise to 7000 8000 rupees i am told 8000 rupees and uh, i think it is currently available at 5000 rupees so if i have to give you one uh, request probably i would request i would urge all of you to make at least one of your colleague as a life member of chest council of india and let us grow together thank you yeah i would strongly request everyone here to if you are not a member to become a cci life member because we strive for academic excellence and we always try to grow together now to sum up i would really want to thank the people behind the show dr vijay kumar chennam chetty our cci webinar coordinator the most difficult job he actually has to satisfy all our egos nahi mujhe aadha ghanta chahiye usko 5 minute dena but he satisfies all of us thank you dr vijay kumar chennam chetty i would want to thank our founder trustees who have recently stepped down dr nh krishna whose brain child this webinar was dr narayana pradeep who is always the spine the backbone with us i would want to thank all our panelists over here investing 2 hours of your time when supposedly practice is high is something a very big sacrifice and we all are enriched with your experience 25000 patient experience you shared inside one and half hours that is something very very respectful and i would want to thank our current office bearer our cci president dr m narendra sir our cci secretary dr ravi doshi sir and our sponsors without which we are very much handicapped sipla respiratory for running the show to everyone over there stay safe stay positive in your mind have a great day have a great time thank you thank you thank you Ati, you did a fantastic job i must uh, uh, compliment you wonderful yeah well thank you